I'm James Beckwith, President and CEO of Five Star Bank. As a community bank, we believe that open dialogue about the issues affecting our region is vitally important. From the economy to the environment to social issues, we look forward to the conversations and hope you'll join in. Social entrepreneur, educator, and blogger Jonathan Lewis found that no matter how many young people he met seeking meaningful careers in social change, he was only scratching the surface of the demand for his advice and coaching. Ionpoverty.tv was his solution. Ionpoverty.tv interviews leaders making change around the world and sharing how they did it. These interviews range from the practical to the personal. Putting these conversations on the web make them available to all. Today, Jonathan Lewis joins us to talk about ionpoverty.tv, social entrepreneurship, and his perspective in making change in the world. So Jonathan, where did the idea for ionpoverty.tv come from? As part of the work I do on poverty alleviation, economic justice issues, um, I, I have the benefit, the luxury, the the privilege of uh, visiting lots of conferences, student conferences, adult conferences about social change. And one day I just happened to be doing the math and realized that the numbers of people that are able to attend those conferences is relatively small, maybe 10,000, 20,000, relative to the 80 million young professionals and students in the United States who care about social change are the new generation, the so-called millennial generation. Well, and so the question became, let me just finish the uh -huh. thought, and the question became is how do we reach them? And the answer to that is internet. They're already idealistic. They need the skills of change. They want to get involved. They want to be donors. They want to be employees. They want to be impact investors. And so I Am Poverty was birthed. Well, well the question yeah, you raise is, yeah. is uh, there are a lot of cynics who don't believe that this generation is committed to anything. What's, what's been your experience? My experience is that the cynics are wrong. Okay. Plain and simple. Uh, this is an idealistic... Usually they're baby boomers, you know. No generation could be as committed to social change as we were. I would say to my fellow baby boomers, uh -huh. get a life. <laughs> they're, they're just completely... Um, it, it's, the e it, it, it's the egocentric part of the baby boomers, which is the least attractive. This generation is us still learning how to do budgets, still learning how to, still not yet having all the life experiences that we've had, but they have the same idealism. They have a natural global citizenship. They are ready to pick up the cudgels of social change. They just need the tools to do it and the chance. And, and how are they different than the baby boom generation? I think they are much more collaborative. Really? Yes, mm -hmm. and they are not, they don't think in terms of we, they. I think our generation, because it was, um, took on so many th battles that were battles. Environmental, there was a sense of, of evil people polluting the environment. There was a, a lousy war in Southeast Asia and it had to be stopped. Don't trust anybody over 30. And don't trust anybody over 30 was exactly the mantra. Civil rights was started as a, um, overturning the status quo. This generation has a different take. They don't see the we they divide. They're interested in collaborative models of social change. And it's really heartwarming. Now, now you know, a cynic might, might also say that, you know, that's the old John Vaskin Sellos, you know, let's raise everybody's self-esteem and everybody gets a trophy for per participating, that that's collaboration. And that that merely speaks to the fact that sure. we've lost our competitive edge and China's gonna eat our lunch. It has nothing to do with self-esteem. I think, in fact, social change starts when you leave your ego at the customs office and you enter into new environments as, as a good listener and in the service of others. And I think this generation gets that. I don't think it has anything to do with touchy-feely, good guy stuff. There's a role for all of that, mm -hmm. but that's not what this is about. There's a difference between well-motivated and well-run. And this generation is stepping up with a different aesthetic, a different a different motivation, a different zeitgeist about how to change the world. So you're, you're doing something different too because mm -hmm. most leadership programs or social mm -hmm. change related leadership programs, mm -hmm. Teach for America, Coro Foundation, uh, 
right. whatever, okay? Mm -hmm. It's always about a discrete pool of people that have been sort of culled away mm -hmm. and are sitting on the side. But, mm -hmm. but all of that knowledge and, and power mm -hmm. that comes from whatever training they get is really captured by just a few people. You're, you're democratizing the access to that. Correct. Who's your audience? Our audience are graduating seniors in college, okay. junior seniors, recent graduates who may be significantly underemployed trying to pay off student loans, and young professionals who've taken jobs that have no soul. That's the audience. And what our um, videos are talking about is what are the concrete, nitty-gritty, day-to-day steps you need to take to lead an honorable life in a sometimes um, dishonorable world. And that's what it's about. We're not talking about the it. We're not talking about water or health or microfinance or any particular uh, solution because in the end, poverty is a multidisciplinary problem. We're talking about the skill sets you need to have high impact, how to get a job, keep a job, how to earn and learn. Uh, it would seem, though, that many of those lessons would have relevance across <laughs> the spectrum. Exactly. I mean, the sh what I've learned in mm. the IonPoverty.tv uh, studios is that the lessons of social entrepreneurship that the same questions that young people are asking are the same questions that 55-year-olds are asking who want to uh, now come into this space. And in fact, in large measure, they're the life lessons that we all constantly revisit as we try to step up our game, be better family members, better community members, and better global citizens. It's, it's really uh, all of a piece. Now, your, um, your participants are called Pathfinders. Yes. Okay. So how, what's the criteria for being a Pathfinder? You have to meet two criteria. Mm -hmm. One is you have to be an accomplished change agent. So you have to have done something in the world where you've proved your chops. And secondly, you have to have the, um, the personal character to, to talk about personhood and how you execute on that. Because we want to get under the, I'm not an auto guy, but get mm -hmm. under the, the hood, so to speak, mm -hmm. of, of how change happens and what skills you need. Now, I, I was on your website and I, I watched a couple of the videos. And one, one thing, there was a, a particular acronym that was used mm -hmm. that I got to get a definition for. It. Sure. It's called poverty pornography. Yes. What is poverty pornography? Uh, a lot of, um, it's used as a, a pejorative phrase mm -hmm. by um, a large number of thought leaders in the poverty alleviation or economic justice space. And it's the notion that you show poor people as hopeless, helpless, and in desperate need, as opposed to your partners as, as, uh, um, as the textured human beings that they truly are and as your partners in the social change effort. So instead of uh, uh, creating poverty programs that empower people to speak up and speak out for themselves, you d the, the programs tend to morph into more of a dependency kind of program, always on the charitable side of things. Isn't that kind of though a new notion though? In fact, because uh, uh, many of the supposed anti-poverty programs, both domestically and abroad, have been about just sort of like, you know, staunching the, the, the bleeding wound, you know, not really healing the underlying problem. And so this notion of a, a true empowerment solution where you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. give the person right. or you teach the person to fish rather than give them a fish for a day. Right. How, how did this notion come into vogue? Because it doesn't seem like many of the programs, particularly in this country, have been constructed really to finally solve I, the problem. I, I, let me interrupt. I, I don't agree with that. Okay. I, I don't think the programs have been constructed to create dependency or necessarily to uh, foster economic opportunity. I think that they have been programs that came out of uh, society, our societies and internationally as well, um, an instantaneous desire to alleviate pain. These are mistakes of the heart. In the implementation of them, sometimes they get <laughs> bollocked up. Mm -hmm. and, and, but it's not an either or. There are different times, I use the phrase, you need to be a pragmatic pluralist, neither for-profit, non-profit, neither private sector uh, or public sector. I mean, you know, the truth is a, um, a person who's drowning really doesn't care. They don't even ask whether the, the agency that paid for the life preserver is a taxpayer 
or a shareholder or a charity. <laughs> they just want the life preserver. They don't care if the lifeguard's a public or a private sector worker. So I, I think these divisions tend to get overwrought in the discussions around ideology, um, which are more appropriate to campus dorm rooms and academic journals. In the real world, poverty is a multidisciplinary problem. You need multidisciplinary solutions, and you need them at all levels of intervention. Period, end of story. But, but in, in, in saying that, the silos that are around many of mm -hmm. the approaches to poverty issues uh, almost seem to suggest that it's more noble to have more of a siloed approach. Let me give you an example. Yeah, okay? do that. So, in uh, typically, you're supposed to go to work for a nonprofit. Nonprofits do this work. You can't trust a for-profit to come up with poverty solutions. The notion is is that, and if you and that a nonprofit can be trusted because the people there don't mm -hmm. have a what's in it for me piece, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, motivation, but. What you're talking about is really breaking down silos and using the best approaches from whatever discipline because you're attacking the problem and, you're, and you are less concerned with sort of like where it comes from. More to the point, yeah. the millennial generation is less concerned. They're looking at solutions that work and they're not into this ideological or holier than thou debate, for-profit, non-profit, public sector, private sector, they just want to go out and be in partnership with the communities that they want to work with and get something done. And it's that rooted sense of um, problem solving that A, makes I think the most, um, the most nimble and most impactful social entrepreneurs, but it's also what's so endearing and hopeful about young professionals and students today. They don't come with these blinders on. These are this is old, old stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, let's let's hang with old stuff for just one okay. more second because right. let's talk about social entrepreneurs. Okay. okay? The notion is still mm. within many sectors of society that combining entrepreneurship of any sort, okay, with an overall social mission mm. bastardizes the social mission. It's wrong. I get the I, I get the concern, but there's there's no. Um, there's no life experience which justifies that. Large institutions of all types mess up. Small. Uh, let me give you a few examples in our U.S. Uh, in, uh, community. We have the largest nonprofit socialized highway system in the world. Government funded, government directed, government policy, and then we use the private sector to pour the cement. We also have the largest private sector educational system in the history of humankind, and it's called, and it's developed privately and with a little bit of government help. It's called the laptop computer. <laughs> I, I just don't think these are real debates in the real world. And, and more importantly, it's not a debate that's front and center for this new emerging generation of change leaders. They want solutions, they're not, you know, uh, the tax status of an organization is a tax status. It's not a management style. They want from, solutions. From your lips to yeah. the IRS's ears. All right, <laughs> fair <laughs> enough. But really, I, I, this is just, um, I get why it's a, a discussion, mm -hmm. but it has no real meaning in a poor village in the developing world. It has no real meaning outside of uh, the tax code and a few theoretical discussions on here in the U.S. And more importantly, it's not germane to the life careers of young people who are interested in rolling up their sleeves and getting started. They can learn terrific skills from a well-run nonprofit or a well-run for-profit. They can have a huge impact working for a well-run for-profit or a well-run non-profit. One, and if it's not well-run, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what the tax status is. This is true. One of the, one of the interesting common themes mm -hmm. in watching a number of your interviews is that a number of your pathfinders seem to feel that small is beautiful. You don't have to go to work for the Ford Foundation. You can work in some smaller, mm -hmm. discrete program and really kind of make your bones, so to speak, mm -hmm. in those sorts of environments. Do you have a perspective on that yourself? Well, 
What I think is true, and I think what you heard on our videos, is we're talking about uh, immediate advice to a young person. So the advantage of working in a small organization is, first of all, you get, this, you get your hands into more of what the whole organization does so you can learn more parts of it, how to, you know, the management side, the fundraising side, the program side, and so forth. So that's a big plus. Secondly, smaller organizations tend to be closer to the clients or people they're working with, which means that you get a really deep sense of whose side you're on. You really see the problems. Secondly, you develop a life and un, um, skilled or knowledge base that stays with you forever, which is essentially the old story of what Peace Corps um, uh, volunteers have always learned, which is you really see where there are market imperfections. You really see the problems of the constituencies you're working with and you internalize them. Those are great skills to learn at the start of your career when you can afford to learn them. I don't think it's a substitute though for also developing the higher or more uh, sophisticated skills that you can learn in a larger organization about scale and reaching large numbers of people, managing large budgets, personnel issues, and so forth. You need both over the course of your career. So be a pathfinder for the young people that are, are gonna be watching us mm -hmm. having this conversation. And if I'm a young person who really has a passion mm -hmm. to make change in whatever area I do, I'm, I'm ready to take that step. Give us kind of a, a, a few first steps in trying to figure out how to move forward on that. All right. Well, the first thing I would say is it can't be cosmetic. This has to be part of who you are. Being a change agent in the world is pretty existential. It's about who you are as a person. So if you're doing it to fatten up your resume to get into college or, your, or for your next job, forget it. It, it, it'll, it's phony and we'll all know it right away. If you're serious about it, there are hundreds of ways you can develop your skills and increase your market value for future jobs and wherever you're going in your life. Right here in the community, you could come volunteer for KVIE and learn to be a fundraiser or learn to run programs or uh, develop your accounting skills or wherever your life uh, goals take you, for starters. You can also look at hundreds of programs that will take you overseas to uh, have uh, overseas ex uh, experiences in the developing world. The three things you should look for is that you're serious about the cause because there are a lot of tough days and you need to really believe in what you're doing. Secondly, you have to have jobs that align with what your skill set interests are. If you have a desire to uh, pursue a career in medicine, maybe working digging wells <laughs> in the developing world isn't the smartest choice. Sure. Do things. And thirdly, you should work with people who respect you as, a, as the person you are and with whom you'll have fun working. Those three elements are the things that I advise young people to look for when they take a position. Let me give you an a, a additional consideration. Do you agree with that? Can I, I do it. I do agree with okay. that. Um, as a matter of fact, and so where I'm going oh, in, okay. in terms of what mm -hmm. I want to find out next, mm -hmm. which is what's your definition of success ba based on that, that guide path? Oh, that's a great question. What I have relearned, mm -hmm. as we all keep relearning all our lives, interviewing people uh, for Ion Poverty TV is that success is, um, there are so many ways for us to design the mo uh, success. One of the most moving interviews was with a woman who um, in her freshman year at the University of California at Los Angeles became pregnant and chose to keep her child, went through school, took her a little bit longer, got her master's, she now runs uh, a very prestigious uh, foundation in California. And she said on camera, she said that when you have to take care of one person, that person leads you. And I thought how important that is for us to remember that sometimes the most important scale is a constituency of one. And that throughout our lives, how we approach um, social change is, is, has to come from within us. We have to appreciate that that impacting people can be tutoring, it can be a good listener at a hospice mm -hmm. center, or it could be, as you talked about earlier, 
the, the larger scale grow, uh, problems because of course poverty globally is an enormous problem. It's really a scourge on, on all of us. One out of seven people uh, go to bed hungry every let, night. Let me, let me share with you, give you my own definitions. Please, success, I'd and, appreciate that. And see that. how it kind of marries up with what you're okay. saying. When, when I talk to young people about mm -hmm. this issue, I yeah. say find your passion, whatever it is, find mm -hmm. your passion. Mm -hmm. and find a way to spend the 10,000 hours, something you're so passionate about, right. that you'll spend the 10,000 hours that Malcolm Gladwell talks about right. in Outliers that it right. takes to become a true master mm -hmm. at that particular passion, mm -hmm. and then find a way to make the world pay for it so that that way you can sustain <laughs> yourself. And if there's something that, you're will, that you love so much or are so committed to that if you won the lotto tomorrow, You'd show up wherever it is that you do that passionate work. You'd show up at 7 a.m. again, and you'd work the same 9, 10, 11, 12 hours, and you'd do it for free. Okay. To so me, where, that's, where, that's, in you, where you and I would give slightly different advice? Sure. <clears throat> I don't think that sometimes in our life we know what our passion is. And so I, I'm, I'm a believer in jumping in, getting mm -hmm. started, okay. and sometimes... We mess up. We, we but you think, find out faster. You do find out uh -huh. faster, but you get started. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'm loath to say to people, find your passion, because it can be paralyzing. Mm -hmm. It can leave you on the sofa thinking, playing a mental head game. What's mm -hmm. my passion? What about this? What mm -hmm. about that? And there's nothing like trying it out. And even as you're trying it out, you're developing skills. You're developing how to write a press release or, your, or, or, or communicate in, in board meetings mm -hmm. or doing is its own reward. There, the, I think the thing, uh, I believe that basically action is the currency of social change. Sure. And sometimes we overthink things and that's a luxury that you have if you don't have to feed your kids every day and you're not in poverty. I, I'll give you a different way to, to sort of frame that. Okay. You may not be able to do all the things you find out, mm -hmm. but you should find out and try all the things that you might be able to do. Oh, agreed. So uh, um, I, I don't think we're as far apart as you, as you might think. Right. So I want to find out, what is it that gets you up every day now? You oh. know, you, you're, you're an entrepreneur, you sit on a number of boards, you write your blog, you do your mm -hmm. interviews, you, do, you teach at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. but, but Today, with all of that uh, CV of accomplishment behind right. you, what is it that gets you up? Well, this morning it was having to come to the studio and be and we're glad you're here. <laughs> we are glad you're so, here. Um, I really, I, I know it sounds a little sappy, yeah. but I really am, the wind in my sails right now is this generation of mm -hmm. young people. I got an email from a student at Texas, uh, I think she's at um, University of Texas, Austin, when we launched I on Poverty TV, and she wrote, she said, uh, I had no idea anyone felt the way I do about changing the world. I'm on a journey for justice. <laughs> and you know, that gets me up in the morning. A couple of emails like that every week, uh, that, that's pretty exciting stuff because all of us had moments in our lives when we had a moment of obligation where we were going along, we were following a path, and we had a discovery about ourselves and our place in the world, and it took us on a different path. Mark Twain said the two most important days in your life um, is, is the day you're born and the day you discover why. Uh -huh. And that, that, that excites me. Hmm. That really does. And so uh, it, as you're playing your role in helping young people discover mm -hmm that why, mm -hmm. what, what are some of the rules of the road from a cautionary tale perspective that you give them as well? You give them inspiration, mm -hmm. but what do you give them in terms of guidance, in terms of here's some of the signs if you're getting off track? Well, I, I think the, 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 the honest answer to that is I don't know. <laughs> you know, if I knew that, I would not go off track myself as often as I do. You actually go off track. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> e e often. E even the master makes e a mistake every once in a while. The master is actually a master at mistakes. That's my <laughs> specialty area. The, to make the distinction, 
to try and let me rephrase that. I, I uh, start again. I think that it's to pay attention to yourself. Mm -hmm. When you're in a room, when you're in a meeting, when you're at a job interview, wherever you are, if you're not listening, you're screwing up. That you need to be, uh, we need better listeners. And I think there's a tendency for young people and old people to want to be better talkers. We, we, we reward speakership in our society more than we reward listenership. And if you can stay close to your listenership skills and refine them, hear what your boss is really saying to you, hear what your colleagues are really saying to you, hear what your constituency, whether it's a constituency in an impoverished village or a constituency of potential funders are really talking about with the, being a good listener, I think you stay, you, you pretty much stay centered on what, what uh, you, where you need to go. And more importantly, it's the power position in every room. All right, and we're going to have to leave it there. Great. Jonathan Lewis, Eye on Poverty TV, dot TV. Mm -hmm. Much success to you. Thank you very much. And hope you'll come back soon. Anytime. Well, that's our show. Thanks to Jonathan Lewis for being our guest, and thank you for watching. For Studio Sacramento, I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. I'm James Beckwith, President and CEO of Five Star Bank. As a community bank, we believe that open dialogue about the issues affecting our region is vitally important. From the economy to the environment to social issues, we look forward to the conversations and hope you'll join in.